thank you everybody for being here. Uh, today we welcome uh, Thibaut uh, Nidley from uh, Sciences pour l'Onologie de Montpellier, INRA et Montpellier. Um, and uh, he will be talking about some model onological ecosystems with yeast. Thank you. Um, so if you have questions, I prefer that you cut me and we discuss it. So it will be more discussion. It's a little longer, but I think it's more interesting. So if you have a question, you can stop me, okay? So I'm uh, from uh, Science for Onology. I'm a microbiologist and I work on all thematic about uh, ecological uh, dynamics in different fermented food, in wine and in bread. And here I'm going to present you the work of uh, my last PhD student, Eleonore Porcelo, that defends her PhD in December. So all the work that I will show from, it's from her work. So I'm working in onological fermentation. So it's a process of transformation of the sugar in uh, ethanol and CO2 that is done mostly by yeast during the alcoholic fermentation. They use the resources to multiply and make biomass. And it's going to produce ethanol, CO2, and aromas uh, that would give the taste of the wine. So how it works? Uh, you have two main resources in wine. Uh, uh, resources like uh, sugars, like glucose and fructose, and different nitrogen sources like amino acids, ammonia. And in uh, energetical conditions, the limiting resource is nitrogen. So there is a growth of the population until all nitrogen is consumed. And after that, the cells are going to be stationary, but they continue to consume the sugar and produce ethanol, aroma, and all other uh, metabolites. So here I have the ethanol, and most of the time, what we follow is the production of CO2. So here the blue line is the speed of production of CO2. And in our lab, that is quite easy to measure because we wait the fermenters, the CO2 gets out, and so it's getting lighter and lighter, and we follow that. So we have very deep uh, measurement of CO2. So there is a complex uh, microbial diversity at the beginning of the fermentation with a lot of different species. I will say the name of this species a lot in this presentation. So you have Ancenia spora ulvarum, Mechticoma pucherina, Torula spora delbrocki, Starmerella bacillaris, and Lachensia tamotolerans. And you have a lot of, of other species that are less present. But what's happening in all fermentation, it's uh, all energetic fermentation, you're going to have a, a rapid invasion by Saccharomyces cerevisiae that always begin at around 5 or 2% of the population. But at the end of the fermentation, it represents 99% of the population. And that is something that we can find in all uh, fermented uh, beverage and also in bread, in a lot of different uh, fermented environments. Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the most effective yeast. And it's why we find it uh, on all commercial products. Most of all commercial products are, uh, are with this species. Hmm? Is it or is it natural? Yes, we know <laughs> uh, It's natural. You have the presence in almost all cases. You have around 2-3% of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, sometimes 10 percent But in 80% of the wineries, they add a selected uh, yeast, most of the time of the species Saccharomyces cerevisiae, to uh, secure the fermentation and to be sure that we, it's finished. It's very important in wine to finish a fermentation and we consider it's finished when all sugar has been consumed. So at the beginning of a fermentation, you have around 200 to 250 grams of sugar in um, uh, energetical must. To give you a comparison, Coca-Cola, it's 120. So you have two times more sugar in wine, in uh, grape must than in uh, Coca-Cola. And you have to consume all of that to be able to sell it at wine. If you still have sugars, you can sell it at wine, so it was very important for the profession to have very effective yeasts that are able to finish the fermentation. But right now, the things are changing, and there is a lot of, um, of uh, reason to go to look at more uh, ecological factors. For example, the, we want to make a lot of reduction of inputs, and in uh, an ecological condition is the sulfate. And the sulfate have two effects. It's an antioxidant uh, product and also an antifungic product. 
So that we want to replace it, for example, we start using bioprotection. So to add one species of bacteria of yeast that will help to protect the wine from uh, um, floors, of, floors of alteration like Brethanomyces boxinensis that give what we call a horse test uh, or eggs but that we don't want. Also, uh, we worked only 50 years to make the best yeast, the best Saccharomyces cerevisiae, but now we see that it's, it gives a little of standardization of the aromas, all wines, uh, for wine winery, all fear will be similar. So there is now development of what we call multi-starter species with the idea to combine different species, for example, a Saccharomyces cerevisiae to end the fermentation, and another one to add, for example, one particular test. And at last, there is a, an increase now of what we call uh, nature wine without any inoculation that we can find also in biodynamy, in bio. All these practices tend to go to without inoculation. So, and when you, when you don't uh, make inoculation, you're going to be dependent of the natural ecosystem. And so it's very important to understand the different mechanisms of um, interactions. And so to understand that, uh, you can't make a lot of different things. You can't study a real ecosystem on the field, but it's very complex. You have a lot of cofactors, you have a lot of yeast and bacteria, and so it's very difficult to understand all the interactions. At the opposite, what we've done for many years is we study monocultures, for example, we study a lot of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We know all of its genes, all of its uh, factors and uh, phenotypes. After that, you can make pairwise interaction uh, to test different things. But uh, with pairwise interaction, you, you lost all high order interactions. So interactions that appear when you have three or more things. So the idea is of the project wise to develop a model community to be able to study ecosystems with a lot of complexity, but without all the complexity, the real complexity of real environments. And so that was the project that I was going to show you. So the goal was to uh, create a model. So we have to choose the species, choose the proportion of the, this, um, different species, implement a method to be able to follow the different frequency of species in mix, because we want to be able to make a link between the phenotype of the ecosystem and the composition of it. Evaluating the strain effect, that is something important because we all know that in one species, you have a lot of strains that don't have exactly the same characteristic. And if I want to build a model that will, rep will be representative of a neurological condition, I have to evaluate at what was the impact of the strains. And at last, you have to uh, be able to diffuse these ecosystems to the community. So. We start by making a review. We look at uh, around uh, 20 papers all across the world that study the uh, diversity of yeast at the beginning of fermentation. So with different kind of uh, various grape variety, various process, and we look at all of that. And with that, we identify these seven species. Uh, we choose the seven species. Uh, these species are the most present in almost across the world. Uh, but for example, Pichia cudresavi, we see that there was other kind of Pichia, but we decide here to maximize the different genesis and also to select uh, species that are, have already been identified as interesting for different applications. For example, Ancenia spora uvarum produce a lot of uh, acetic acid, so vinegar, so it's not good. Meshnikoya Pusherima is the best strain that we use today for making bioprotection. Uh, La Chensa Thermotolerance produces a lot of uh, lactic acid. And Starabena bacillaris, for example, is un uh, the unique species that prefer fructose over glucose in the must. So we choose all these species. And we analyze the frequency at the beginning of the fermentation of all these species in all the papers we see across all experiments. So you have there a box plot showing for each of the species the frequency, and each point here is one sample in one paper experiment. And we selected the red dots are the frequency for all these species. And so our ecosystem was composed like that, with, for example, 
35% of Ancenia Spora Uvarum, 20% of Meshnikova Pusherima, and 10% of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So we use only 5% and not below to be able to facilitate experimentation. And after, we wanted to be able to follow the proportion, and we chose here a cytometry approach. It's more work at the beginning because we have to add fluorescence to each of the species, but it's more simple afterwards to make experiments. So here, what we do is we uh, put our fluorescent genes uh, combined to the TDH3 gene. That is a good. That is a gene that is expressed on, during all the fermentation. So we do this kind of modification for all our species. And for uh, La Chancellor Thermotolerance, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae was pretty easy with uh, 60 uh, base of homology. But for other species, like this one, it was more for, far more difficult. So we need uh, 1,000 base of homology to be able to have the raw combinations. And with one pieces and Meshnikova Pushirema, we didn't be able to transform it at all. That was almost everybody that tried it failed until now. So but we have hope for later, but now it's a, that is a failure. And so with that, we combine it by choosing uh, five different fluorochromes that have different uh, spectra of uh, emission and absorbance to be able to mix them. And so the objective was seven species, but we see that these two fluorescence, TAG B, uh, FP2 and TCFR, were too similar to be able to distinguish, okay. so we have to take, a, take it out. And in the case of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, we had uh, two different fluorochromes, one in TDH3 and another one in the ino 2 genes. So Is with you, uh, your team who actually labeled the organism? Yes, okay. we've done everything, yes. But for cerevisiae, it's very well known, and you can uh, a lot of labs are able to do it with a high throughput, but for all other species, almost you don't have uh, tools to do it, so you have to develop them. So most of the work of the PhD was to develop the method to make the labels. And it's, it was a very long process. Yeah, I think uh, all the process takes her almost two years to be able to have everything. So you're going to see in the presentation, sometimes I have only uh, Saccharomyces label. Sometimes I have only six species, sometimes I have seven. It depends on when we did the experiment during the PhD. Uh, now that I have all my marked, we test mock community. So we make mix of the different populations. For example, here I make, we make uh, five different mixes with the proportion of Ancenia spora uvarum increasing from 1% to 90%, and all other species in equi-proportions. And we've done that for Ancenia spora and we do it, for example, here you have the same thing, but for La Chancellor thermotolerance. So we make all these different theoretical composition, and we measure directly to see if we have a, a good correlation between one we measure and one we put in it. And so here you have the graph. Uh, at the bottom, you have the theoretical concentration, what we think we put in it, and in vertical, you have what we observe. And we are very happy because it's worked very well. We have uh, most of 90% of correlation in all cases. So we were very happy and we were able to, so, to follow, for example, all the dynamic during a mix with all the species. For example, here you're going to have in dash line is the total life population. In orange is Saccharomyces cerevisiae that start low and increase and at the end represent almost all populations. And the blue line with a very big peak, it's the species Ancenia spora uvarum. That is known to be that. She's very effective at the beginning of the fermentation, but she's very sensible to ethanol. So, so she produces ethanol and kills itself and, this, uh, and go back. It's, we don't know. Enfin, we think that she's very well adapted to the grapes and the skin of the grapes, but very badly adapted to the analogical conditions, to the nuts. And so we are capable of following that. So we are happy. But because of the problem with fluorescence, we have to take out one species because we are able to only follow six different. So we take out uh, Pichia Codrezavi because she was the most, the less interesting from uh, uh, 
um, industrial point of view. So we take out, so we have uh, six species ecosystems in our model. Uh, and after that, we look at the strain effect. We wanted to know what would be the influence if I change the strain, for example, of the species Mishniko apusherima on the dynamic of the ecosystem. So the first thing we do is we start by, uh, okay, that I didn't try to do it, but we start by making all the combination two by two between three strands of five species. So with uh, 15 strands, and so it was uh, 105 combinations. So we look, for example, here you have the combination between the, the strain one of the species one and the other strain of the same species. And with that, we can, it's all uh, strain one against strain one will be monocultures. And all the one will be uh, intra uh, species co cultures. So we have all the matrix. And if we test all these species again, another species, you're going to have interspecies co cultures. And by making all the combination like that, you're going to have all the combination. And so we have monoculture, intraspecific co culture, and interspecific co cultures. And the idea was to see if the interactions were was depending on these factors. So for that, we were in uh, microplates with synthetic growth, synthetic must, and we follow uh, absorbance. So we have a monoculture, another monoculture, and we have the co-culture. And by comparing these three codes, we can evaluate the intensity of the interactions. And that was uh, the main thing that we study in this case. And that will be uh, has been done in uh, South Africa, in the Stellenbosch University with Professor Boer and Dr. Konescher. And so here you have all the monoculture for the different species. Each color corresponds to one species. And what we see is that the strains are very similar between them and are more similar between them than the different species. So in monoculture, we have a, a species effect and a strain effect, but uh, the strain effect is lower. And we can also see that, for example, the two in the left, Ancena sporivarum and Staramella bacillaris, are poor fermentation. They have a very small population comparing to the other one. And with that, we analyze what we call area under the curve. We choose this one because it depends on all other factors of lifetime, growth rate. And here you have a matrix of the, uh, the interaction between uh, both. So if you are in red, it's meaning that the monoculture, the co-culture have a, a higher uh, a higher uh, area under the curve than the average of both monoculture. If you are in the blue, you are lower than the average. So with this metric, all that, the diagonal will be the monoculture. And after, for example, here you have all the intraspecies co-culture between all the Saccharomyces species. And there, for example, is all the combination between Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Staramella bacillaris. And when, when we look at this matrix, we see a, a lot of block effects. It's interesting to note that here, the order of the row and the columns, we, are, we didn't choose it. They have been uh, chosen between similarity. So if it's uh, automatic sorting by similarity of uh, interaction patterns, and what we see is that we can find, again, most of the time, species. So, for example, all the Uvaron are together, all the Cerevisi are together, all the Staramella bacillaris are together. Only the Torula spora de Muti and Machensan thermotolescence are a little mix. And so, with that, we deduce that the species will going to determine the type of interaction, positive or negative interactions, and the strengths will only play on the intensity of these interactions. So, the key for interaction in this experiment will be the species. So after that, we wanted to test in more complex uh, ecosystems. So what we done, we take our seven species ecosystems there, and for example, we have a combination that will be the one, the first ecosystem. So we have different species with different strains, and we make random uh, variation of the strain. So for example, in the second ecosystem, we have the same Mechnikovia uh, Pluxerema strain, but a different Ancenia spora strain. And so we make like that nine different ecosystems that are random. Each strain can be found in three 
ecosystem in three different ecosystems, and all the combinations are different. And so we follow uh, all the fermentation for all these different ecosystems. And the idea was to see if we can find uh, the signal of the strain at the level of the phenotype of the ecosystem. And it's not working. <laughs> so here, uh, we don't see a lot, but what we see is that, for example, in lactate, we see different. So you have all nine ecosystems, and in orange, it's Saccharomyces cerevisiae in monoculture as a reference. And we see different variations. And when we look at that, we see that the three, the three ecosystems that produce the most of lactate all have the same strain. So here we have a signal, but it's the only signal in all the data sets. And that we can explain it because the species La Chancer Thermotolaris produce a lot of acid lactic, like you see in the right, that are data for monocultures. And these strains produce twice more than the all other strains of this same species. So when you have that, so when you have one species that have one particular phenotype and the difference between the strains are very important for this particular phenotypes, we're going to see its signature at the level of the ecosystem. But for example, in the case of acetate, if we look at the strain that produce the most of acetate, she's not present on the other, it's not present on the ecosystem that produce the most of acetate. Because here you have different species that produce acetate and the differences between the strains are not so big. And that is the second most strong signal. For all other factors that we look, production of ethanol, growth rate, uh, fermentation power, speed of fermentation, like this, you do, we never find a signal at the level of the ecosystem of the composition of strains. And we think that because you have a lot of uh, compensation between the different species and the different strains. But that is quite interesting, meaning that for we can choose whatever we want about the strain effect, it will, the ecosystem will still be representative of a neurological uh, ecosystem. All right, so the link between uh, the Okay, so we choose the C4 ecosystem as our model ecosystem, and we choose this one because it was the nearest of the average in all phenotypes. So it's an average ecosystem. And so now we have all of the steps that have been done. We have the species, the proportions, the strengths. We can follow in mix all these species. And we also uh, give all these species to the serum levure in Montpellier to be able to everybody to uh, ask for these strengths and use it in their own protocols. And I'm quite proud because already they already have orders to these strengths. So mission accomplished. But we wanted to, we can, how are we going to use it <laughs> this ecosystem to study different things? So we're going to use it to study yeast yeast interactions in the idea of knowledge, but also to uh, design multi species starters, to design bioprotection protocols. We can use it also to better understand the link between initial diversity and wine quality. And the idea in long term is to be able to develop a diagnostic tool for wineries, for example, like a COVID PCR tools uh, kit. You test your wine, your must, and you see that you have this kind of proportion of species, you have to be prepared for this kind of output. For example, if you don't have Saccharomyces cerevisiae at all, you know it will be very difficult to end the fermentation. If you have a lot of ancillary spore overrun, you know that you're going to have a lot of acid acetic. So it will be a help to guide people. And also we can use it to answer microbial questions, like the link between the diversity of the ecosystems and the performance of things. And here we choose a robustness to stress. So it's something very similar to what you've done, Kim. But with, and so I'm going to present a little of this uh, preliminary results about that. So what we've done, again, we make random consortia where the proportion of the different species will vary from a consortia to another one. But here we keep always Saccharomyces cerevisiae at 5% because we know it will invade. And so the, the impact of Saccharomyces cerevisiae is very strong. And if we add it 
to variation of this proportion, we only see the signal of this variation. So all the ecosystems here have different uh, uh, proportions for five species. We have different controls. So we have here equiproportion of all the species except Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Here you have our model ecosystem, the proportions that are in our base system. Here you have uh, only uh, of an equal proportion without Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And as always, as a reference, we have only uh, monoculture of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And if we look at the Shannon index, so it's an index of uh, equitability of uh, the microbial diversity, you're going to have this white curve. So we're going to have an increase in microbial diversity between all these ecosystems. And we wanted to look if the diversity has an impact on robustness. And here we choose osmotic stress. So we make the experiment in two conditions with 200 grams of sugar at the beginning, that is representative of an average mass today, and another one at 280, which is the average concentration of mass in around 10 years in the south of France. And so with that, you're going to have wines at 16, 18 degrees, so it will be strong. And that is one of our big goals in the lab, is try to reduce this uh, problem to, uh, to manage just to make wine less strong. And so that we done. So uh, the first thing is that we didn't really have an osmotic stress senior. Uh, why? Because at 200 grams, it's always very stressful. And between 200 and 280, the stress is not a lot more. But we still have some signals. So what we do is we compare, for example, the yield of production of the central carbon metabolism between 200 grams, 280, and 200. <coughs> and so here you have the signal for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And we see that in the stress condition, it produces a lot of acetic, uh, of, uh, acetic acid and, uh, for example, less of uh, lactic acid. In, if we compare that to the ecosystems, uh, here I present you the is ecosystem, it's our ecosystem, we see that the signals are less important. It's almost always in the same direction, but with less intensity. And that is something that we observe with all the ecosystems. So the stress effect is the trace differences. Observe it's a little less intense in ecosystems than in monocultures, but the signal is very poor. And the other things after we wanted to look if there is an impact of the diversity itself. And uh, we don't have, uh, here you have what you have. Here you have the correlation between the proportion of the four, spe of four species on, uh, for each uh, column, and the last one would be the Shannon index. And you have the correlation between these parameters and all these uh, yields, and the production of CO2, the Vmax is the, is the maximum speed of fermentation of production of CO2, and sugar final is the final concentration of sugars. And in left, you have 200 grams, and in the right, you have 280. And so the first thing we see is that there is no correlation at all be between our phenotype and the Shannon index. But we have a lot of correlation between some the initial proportion of some species and, uh, and different okay. factors. And so it's interesting because we see that different species will impact the phenotype. But the diversity itself here don't have any signal. So to conclude about that, uh, so we, here we don't see any link between equitability and stress response. And there is a, a significant effect of the proportional initial. But if you wanted, if we really wanted to answer our question, we need to make to test many, many more ecosystems. Because here you don't have an independence between the initial proportion of the species and the diversity index. And to reach an independence between these factors, I calculate that I need to test around 300 different ecosystems. Here we test nine. So we want to do it, but we're going to do it in very reduced uh, sample, in microplates, these kind of things, things we want to, to test, and also to uh, make far more variability on uh, the diversity. Here we only play on the proportion of the species keeping all pieces present, but I can also play on the richness, so the number of species. 
So it's something that's going to do in the next, in this year, I hope we're going to do it. How do we do that in microplates? I mean, measuring all the metabolites in... I, I will not be able to measure all the metabolites. I will have to measure only some phenotypes. I can follow the proportion, for example. Yeah, with the, the cytometer. With the cytometer. I can also follow the total population also. And I can follow also, um, I'm trying to build with uh, Dijon to be, a measure, to be able to measure the speed of production of CO2. They have a device where they put two microplates. The microcell at the bottom have your ecosystem and the other microplate have uh, a gel that will uh, change color, but uh, when CO2 goes flow through it. So I'm going to go to visit them in the next month to try to import that. And I can uh, also look at some of, if I do it in deep well, with so two milliliters of, uh, of uh, liquid, I can make some HPLT uh, things. So, but the most difficult part is to produce the 300 combination of uh, ecosystems to do it. But it's very, very long to do it. You couldn't do that with a robot. But we're going to have a robot that is arriving in the next month. Okay. Right now, I have PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and they have weekends and nights. And uh, But we're going to have a robot to help to that, yes. Uh, so I finish. Uh, again, I want to say that all this work is the work of Eleanor Porcelo that, uh, that uh, present her PhD in December. All the people of my team and also Florian Boer and Cleo Konasher from uh, South of Africa and you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>